the Tim Heal Thirsty Thursday live stream from 7 until 9 weekly. Here's your host, Tim Heal. We were at um, Stephanie and Anne's wedding uh, a few weeks ago, and I, a, couple, a few months ago now, mm. and I was the, the master of ceremonies. And um, every time I mentioned Harry, people were wondering who I was talking about. <laughs> yeah, you got me into so. trouble because you said Stephanie's now going to have the first dance with her dad, Harry, and everybody looked at me. I went, it yeah. is his nickname. <laughs> <laughs> I think they thought I had a story to tell that had remained untold. <laughs> and uh, I mean, for, for all, the, all his army mates, um, he, he, from, from the, the first day he got to the battalion, um, he was known as Harry. Um, because his second name is Meekums and it came from Harry Seekums, who used to be a, a comedian singer back in the day, and um, uh, and and he kind of stuck. Uh, so he's he's only ever been known as Harry uh, in, in the in the battalion. And somebody commented at, at, the, at his funeral that they just spied his middle name was Tracy. Oh yes. <laughs> had had that had that come out when he got to the battalion? Uh. <laughs> That's all he would have been known as. Do you know, even his brother said to me the other day on the phone, I never realised his middle name was Harry. I went, John, it wasn't Harry. <laughs> I said, do you know what his middle name was? But he didn't like it. <laughs> I do, he, apparently he was named after the nurse and that was her last name. Her last name was Tracy. So I said, well, just be grateful. It could have been a lot of other things. You wouldn't want to be yeah. stuck with those as a last name. Mm, That's why yeah. he never had the E in. We, we did say to them, can you not like leave that out at the funeral because he won't like it? And they went, no, legally, they have to say it. So I bet he was having a little turnaround in that box. He wouldn't have been happy about that. He should have changed it by depot. Yeah, well, he kept saying it, but he never did it. But, you mm. know, nobody ever used it. And, you know, everybody, even, you know, they all called him Harry. So, you know, yeah. that that sort of went by the by, really. He would have been called Tracy, you know that, didn't oh, you? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> God, I don't even bear thinking about, does it? He would have got used to it eventually. I don't think he would. <laughs> no, perhaps not. No. Um, do you want to see the next part of the story? We do. Okay. What I'll do is I'll drop you all down. Oh, Richard just said thanks for the plug. Um, <laughs> Richard, um, Richard and I go back a long, long way. Um, Richard was in in the band in the Second Battalion, the Royal Anglian Regiment, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he was a drummer and he used to play um, the bugle. and And now he's retired. He he does a lot of uh, bugles, uh, playing last post and revali at a lot of funerals. Mm -hmm. um, so he came and, and and did us the honour of playing at Harry's. Um, and that was really moving. Mm. Um, and I think for, for a lot of the, the civilian friends that he had, uh, I've never sort of seen it done at a funeral before, and I think it moved them. Mm. So let's drop you all down, and then um, and then we'll see the next part of the story uh, for Marie. So I make sure I get the right bit. So this this is the next part of Marie's, uh, Marie's story. Marie, tell us about how you went about writing the book and, and forming the movement. Yeah. So as I said, you know, the first book was more like a love legacy for Rob. I just wanted to share our story and I thought if my way of dealing with grief can just help one or two other people or a couple of people, that would be perfect you know what I didn't expect was the outcome you know that it ranked in the top 100 of Australia and that led me to uh, realize that it is so much more than just our story it really had touched so many people and I decided to open the doors to the global movement loving life after loss and within literally a couple of weeks two three weeks 
I had hundreds of people come in there. And by the end of the first year, I started in March 2019. By the end of the first year, um, we were at around 950 people. I remember then there was a, an article that came out in Mamma Mia. And within two weeks, we doubled our membership. And we've just been growing ever since. It was a lot of media attention. Um, you know, the two biggest channels in Australia, Channel 7 and Channel 9, had both reached out to me, whether they can write about me in their lifestyle sections, which they did. We had so many really big magazines writing about us, sharing our story, and it just went on and on. And out of my own adversity, and every time I came through another milestone, through another roadblock, through another hurdle, I created healing journeys, programs, retreats, out of everything I learned, I shared it with other people. I thought if something that has happened in our life can help other people, that's what I want to do. So in a nutshell, I became really vulnerable in front of the camera, in front of the entire world, basically. I shared straight from my heart and I felt like with me opening up and the more I, the, the more vulnerable I became, the more love came in, if that makes sense. So it created this massive vortex of sharing and receiving love, which I thought was just so beautiful. And I know that sounds very hippie, but it was just really incredible, an incredible journey. And then um, around the end of two, uh, 2021, I remember um, somebody said to me, I think you need to write another book, Marie. And, and I thought, yep, absolutely, I did. So I... Um, I wrote Happy Healing and literally both books for me have been like flow writing, if that makes sense. It was like a download. It was just sharing straight from my heart. It's also written very, um, very much in conversational style. Like I'm telling you the story right now. That's how I write as well. I write and I share straight from my heart. If I talk or write, it's the same thing. And in Happy Healing, I put the emphasis on, well, first of all, sharing what happened after the first book, Loving Love After Loss, how that was turned into a global movement. And then I also share my healing journey in there, which was from grief to relief. It's like a seven-step program that I have taken people through. And I share these steps in the book as well. I wanted something hands-on in there for people. And um, that, that was really beautiful. People actually had a bit of a workbook. There was my story and a workbook to, to deal with. And uh, I felt that was quite helpful for people that needed those first few steps to get out of that stuckness, get out of that first really excruciating pain, if that makes sense. And then last but not least, I wanted to share something about this label of being a widow because I don't feel that I'm a very typical widow. When you look at me, I don't think that's the first thought that crosses your mind. Oh, she must be a widow, not. So I did a TEDx talk about redefining our image of a widow because I really am not a big fan of labels. I understand we need some of them to be able to communicate so we're on the same page so we know what we are talking about but I certainly don't have to live up to that label and I certainly did not. So everything I did in this journey of loving life after loss was about breaking down stigmas around grief, giving people permission to heal. That's the biggest thing. Grief is such an expectation of you have to suffer. People need the allowance to heal. I want people to feel that they are allowed to heal because the pain comes automatically anyway. Nobody needs support in that, but everyone needs support in coming out of that pain. And I believe there's this beautiful field that I often talk about where you neutralize pain to then move forward into happiness. Um, grief is very complex and very unique. You can't just switch people from negative thoughts to positive thoughts. There's this, this field of neutralizing thoughts, of, of, of observing, of touching base, feeling into it, sitting with it. You know, there's a lot that happens and this to me is the healing space. This is where people need support. This is where people need suggestions. And that's what I do best. I, I just absolutely love helping people through that. That's awesome. There you go. There's part three of uh, Marie's story. Um, I think you'll agree with me. It's pretty um, pretty awesome. And, and what she's gone through and the way she's she's dealt with it. I mean, it's only been four years um, and she's done particularly well, I think. 
and writing a book and, and amazing. So I'm just going to bring the guest back in. Um, let's go more shout. <laughs> There you go, you're all back in the room. Yes, we're back. <laughs> so what did you guys think to Marie's story? Well, she's turned a negative into an amazing positive, hasn't she? And helping other people along the way. I mean, yeah. she, she must have reached quite deep down to, you know, express all those feelings. And I dare say a lot of the time she was doing it with tears in her eyes. What an amazing lady. Mm. Yeah, it's a really, really good chat we had on Monday. There's one one part you have to come. So, I um, love yeah. the part though when she talked about sitting with it, sitting with because I think that's something, and whether it be grief, um, or any painful thing, we tend to push it aside. I don't have time for that. I need to do these things, and I think like the sitting with it and going ahead and feeling those feelings is that in between it does help us to deal with it um mm. but i think you know distracting ourselves all the time or being busy all the time is not doesn't really isn't helpful um it is good to be able to to sit with it and mm. feel whatever that is yeah um, well before we go too much for everyone i just want to put a correction. <laughs> Richard was in the core of drums, not the band. Now the core of drums and the band are two separate things, but they do a lot of work together. Just put that out there. So core <laughs> drums is drums and bugles, and uh, the band is all the other instruments, and uh, that's how they do it. And then I just want to say a quick shout out to a few people that actually clicked the like button. <laughs> so Ray, Dougie, uh, Steve and Charlie, thank you very much. Um, got a couple of loves from uh, Marga and Corinne and uh, a well from Richard. <laughs> so, so thank you very much. So anybody else out there that like, would like a little mention, just click the like button. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't cost anything, does it, my life? <laughs> so, <laughs> and if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, you know you can do that and it doesn't cost you nothing. <laughs> And there's nothing on on a Thursday. <laughs> there's nothing on the telly anyway. <laughs> so, well, Jim, something I would add to the other the other comments are her perspective on what would her husband have wanted. Uh, that's that's a great perspective. I mean, I think about that regularly with Grace, and uh, it's 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 tough to maintain that perspective, but she's. She's walked through it. I mean, and that's really the answer for everyone is you have to walk through it. And it is it is one step at a time. And some days are slow steps, some are baby steps, but if you just keep walking forward, I mean, it's uh, um, but the perspective of what, you know, so what would, you know, my, my daughter Grace had a sense of humor. So, I mean, to think about what would she want? I mean, she'd want us to keep continuing on. There's no doubt about it. Well, Stephen, we, we had had this conversation many times. This isn't what I thought he wanted. He had planned his own funeral. We both have, and they're paid for as well. After my mum and dad died, they died 10, minute, 10 months apart, and I found it very traumatic having to do all this, and I didn't want the girls to go through it. So we both went out, we did our own funeral plan, and we planned our own funerals. Well, Stephen and I, for a long time, were arguing um, over this because I said, you know what, we're going to be sitting there upset. I don't think these songs you want, I don't think they're appropriate. He said, yeah, but, you know, it's because he, he had always looked on the bright side of life on the way out, didn't he? And on yeah. the way in, he had Born to be Wild, but he wanted Highway to Hell, but they wouldn't play it. <laughs> um, so we already knew all this. The the only thing we had to do was one of the readings because um, that he didn't choose. And that was the one about just think of me as if I'm in a different room. So that that literally mm. was, um, you know, our, our, our input into that because this wasn't us supposing what he wanted. This was him telling us what we were going to do. And you know what? He got the last word, didn't he? 
because he got what he wanted. He's waited a long time for that, 44 years, but he done it. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I think that, that is something that everybody can take from that story, is that sit down with your loved one and have that conversation. I mean, you can, it's a weird way of starting a conversation, but um, an opening line could be, um, darling, what music would you like played at your funeral? <laughs> Yeah, or something could come on the radio and you could go, that's what I want at my funeral. But yeah. what, what, yeah. what happened to Stephen is every time we went to a funeral, he would come out and go, that's a lovely, that was a lovely service, but that's not what I want mine to be. So I'd go, well, what do you mean? And then he would say. So we would we would always get into it um, that way. But, I mean, I'm terrible. When the songs that I want come on the radio, I say to my kids, oh, I want that my funeral. But I've... You know, it's already written down. They know exactly what I want. So, you know, because I just thought it would make it easier for them. I said, their only job is to go to the funeral directors or of the day of the funeral and big me up in the in the eulogy. That's their only job. Because <laughs> everything else is already sorted out for them so they don't have to worry about it. So I, I have a question, Tim. Is that okay to ask? Yeah, absolutely. So what is the recommended amount of time between writing the annual life insurance premium check and talking about the <laughs> should there be a separation or can you have that conversation the same day? Well do you know what um, Stephen had sure both told us he had life insurance. We didn't know. Okay. It, it it literally wasn't until I was going through all the bank statements, you know, doing all the things that you have to do and every, all the bills were in his name, so they all then had to go into my name. And there's all these insurances coming up, and I'm saying to the kids, what are these for? So we had to phone up the companies, literally, and say, uh, why are we paying this? And they go, oh, yeah, life insurance. And we go, oh, cause, because he never said. So I don't, sure know like when the I don't know when the time frame would be, but I'd say it's good to mention it. Yeah. Or at least mm. let people know where everything is. So I've gone through this thing where I've put all my stuff together, and I've said to everybody, this is where it is because with Stephen, it's all been a bit difficult because everything was here, there, and everywhere, and you know, filed behind the city, and just it's all been a bit mad with really. him. <laughs> but you know, Stephen, that was him. Yeah, it with the yummies. <laughs> yeah, oh, with the oh, with the yummies, definitely with the yummies. Yes, we did check down the side of the city, and there was yummy wrappers. We did find them. <laughs> so, uh, so these are really key points that. that everybody can take from is, is a you have the conversation uh, about what happened when you die try and get all your affairs in some sort of order mm. um and, and find out what somebody wants at their funeral it, it, i know it's, it, to start with it'll be a difficult conversation i mean darling what would you like to play at your funeral <laughs> boy what you're planning <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah don't give them dinner and then ask they'd be suspicious <laughs> yeah. you know and, and a, and a top tip, if, if you never take a flowers home, don't start, <laughs> because that'll set her off. <laughs> well, Stephen used to bring them home every Friday, and he used to say, what have you done? And then we was at, we was at an army do, and someone was moaning about Dartford Tunnel, where you had to pay. And Stephen said to him, oh, yeah, but if you look on the left-hand side, there's a guy who sells roses. They're only three quid. I just nip over there and buy, buy some roses, and then I have change. <laughs> So this is why I used to get roses every Friday. Oh, how romantic. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. So it's it's really important that, um, that we try and bring bereavement and uh, into everyday conversation because it's the one guarantee that every single person that's living is guaranteed to do they're going to die and there's no getting out of it i mean voldemort never managed it nicholas the film uh flamel never managed it um you've all got <laughs> to go sometime uh, and people shouldn't find it difficult to talk about um and if if you look at it as a celebration of a life that's been lived then it makes it a little bit easier than trying to mourn a life that's been and 
and if people can do that and and, and just bring up in everyday conversation and I think that is a start I mean because we all know somebody that's died I mean Doris down the road died a few weeks ago um, my mate Mitch died a couple of weeks ago um, so his funeral's a uh, week after next um, so I'm hoping to go down to Plymouth for that and uh, give him a bit of a send off and we'll all have parents who get older yeah I mean, it's, 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 it's difficult to lose a parent, um, mm. but we all know that the parents generally go before um, before us, but it it's really, really difficult to lose a, 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 a daughter or a son. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I guess it, it's even harder if they, they've taken their own lives or they've been in an accident or it, it's it's caused by somebody else that you've lost them mm. um uh, and and losing a spouse as well i mean that's that's i mean that's tough i mean a soulmate uh is is, is one of the toughest things to lose but losing children um it, again but we need to have these sorts of conversations to to, to normalize it to make the, the 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 grieving process a little bit easier if we can talk about it then and destigmatize it make it um a, a not a taboo subject to talk about and i think that's the angle that we are trying to do on this show is to to get that message out there for people to say it's okay to talk about these subjects mm. so um shall we have part four who's up for part four Definitely. Good. Right, here we go then. Let's drop you all down. Um, so, this is part four of Marie's story, um, and this is where she's got to now. So, stand by. She's in the room. I, I guess that's the essence. Is is going? Everybody has to go through that that grieving mm. process. And it is a process because yeah. you've got the initial part of the. Uh, uh, some people it's anger, some people it, it's it's disbelief, some people some people it's it's just the the that immediate pain of the loss mm. of, of a loved one, mm. and then and then you go through into to the next phase of of you go into almost autopilot to be able to 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 do all the the. the practical things of, of counselling bank accounts and, and yeah. organising a funeral and, and, yeah. and all the it's rest of it. A lot of paperwork. It went on for one and a half years. I know. It, sometimes it can be an absolute nightmare, particularly if somebody has, has died without leaving a will, and that is another nightmare. Mm. Uh, and, and their estate goes into test date, and oh, yeah. it's, just, it's another minefield. And it's just... Mm add into the to the problems of the the, the process yeah um, so you might just want to sorry please uh, and so then then you come on to the to the realization of of, of coming out of it and, and it sometimes takes two or three years before mm -hmm. you actually accept that somebody's gone and if you haven't had the conversation with them beforehand mm -hmm. uh, of what they want for you going forward then, then that makes that process even harder, I guess. I guess it very much comes down to your mindset as well and to your choices. And Rob was the one who always taught me about the concept of choices. You know, um, again, it, it comes back to people's beliefs and, and to their spiritual beliefs. On a very deep down spiritual level, I trust that Rob and I have chosen this journey. And... Uh, that set aside because I fully respect that everybody's got different beliefs. Even those who say, well, I did not choose to lose my husband. You can mm. still choose how you respond to it. The responsibility, the response ability lays with you how you respond to adversity in your life. And it comes back to choices. It comes back to allowing support in allowing help in that's a really big one it's not an easy one in grief when you are in so much pain to allow somebody in 
to sit with you, to support you, and also to understand who actually is really supportive. And that's with no malintent. Some people just don't know how to support you in that because they come from that space of what society expects you to do with grief, which I don't agree with. And that led me to that one comment I wanted to make when you touched on anger and um, coming to terms with it. There's this misconception of these five stages of grief and they were originally uh, written by Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who's absolutely, absolutely renowned in the space of grief. But she wrote these stages for terminally ill people, not for grieving people. Until this day, they are still called five stages of grief, which is absolutely not mm. true, you know. They truly do apply for terminally ill people, but when you think about it, they don't always apply um, to grieving people. In my case, I never felt anger. I never felt bargaining or denial. It was, you know, um, I cannot relate to these stages of grief, if that makes sense. You might find some traces of it in it, but it's another attempt of society to put labels onto something they can't find words for. That's just my humble opinion here. And I, I guess that's one of the things that we're trying to bring out in this 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 conversation that we're having about bereavement, that it's yeah. different for everybody. Yeah. And yes, there. So, I, I guess for somebody that's been terminally ill, that that you know it's coming, or mm. an old person that, that's that's going downhill, you know it's going to happen. To somebody that dies suddenly, mm. there's. There's a kind of a different mindset, a different way of, of dealing with it, I guess. Yeah. Um, it's it's kind of slightly easier to deal with, with a, a prolonged illness where you know the, the outcome. To, I, to I wouldn't that say that, to be honest, with all due respect. I think I've, I've spoken to so many people who've had this experience of that prolonged uh, illness and the anticipatory grief that comes with it is really quite debilitating it's very heavy to carry and some people carry that for 10 years so or like you know I don't want to put an exact time frame on it but for years you know and I do not envy them I would not want to swap with them and of course you can say well you wouldn't want another 10 years with Rob well yes but not for the price of him suffering for 10 years just so I've got him with yeah. me longer do you know what I mean so this is a very um very uh, vulnerable territory to say what is easy and what is not. I don't think that any any journey of grief is easy. Um, it is really a matter of how you deal with it and how well you're supported throughout it all. Yeah, uh, I, I, I didn't mean it was easy to deal with it. Mm. It's, it's because you know it's coming. Mm. Um, and it's, I think, that the, the, the initial part of the anger is that a long drawn out illness is horrendous and and i mean i went through it with my late wife i mean unfortunately she got cancer for a second time uh, yeah. going through it the first time was was, was a, a year and mm. it was it was horrible going to 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 chemotherapy and all the rest yeah. of it involved with it and, and then they said that as long as she, if she's clear for, for two years, she'll, she'll probably be okay. Mm. A year and 11 months later, it came back and it was much, much more aggressive. And yeah. um, the, the, the second time was even worse. Um, uh, unfortunately, it, it only lasted for about six weeks before she died. Uh, and that mm. was, I mean, that was it's tough. To almost the exact same time frames for my dad. It was very similar. It's been... Yeah. 30 years yesterday that my dad passed and it was the same thing, you know, after about two years the cancer came back and it was so aggressive it took him in four weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my heart goes out to you, Tim. I, I so, I mean, that, that was back in 2006. Um, mm -hmm. We um, still, still remember her fondly. I mean, we were married for 23 years and uh, mm -hmm. we were together for 25 and... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and fortunately, I married my um, my best mate's wife, uh, who were, mm. we were best mates at the time. He died mm. a year before her, um, yeah. and we got together about four years after my wife died, and we got married. We've been married for twelve years, and we're really happy. And, 
Andrea, we can still have those conversations about mm -hmm. them because we remember all the times that we had together. Yeah. And that, that for us has made the whole thing bearable, I suppose. Yeah. That's such a blessing. It's mm -hmm. hidden gifts in adversity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that's what we're trying to do with this is, is trying to, to help people see that there, there are different ways through and different ways of coping. And mm. at the end of the day, it's your own journey. But there is an awful lot of help out there to be able to, to get you through it. And yeah. for, for what you've done with your, your process, helping other people is, is pretty awesome. So mm, I can only thank you. thank you for that, and uh, mm. we'll push, push your books and uh, get people to watch your TEDx. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. The Tim Heal Thirsty Thursday live stream from seven until nine weekly.